Good morning, folks. Part two of the Plasma Climate Forcing series is coming this weekend, hopefully tonight, but we've got our members podcast for the website and I've got some daddying to do on my end first, not to mention running down the list here starting at spaceweathernews.com. The last day on our star finds the southern hemisphere somewhat more interesting than the north. Strings of patchy coronal holes cross center longitudes while the southern active region continues its approach. As I mentioned on Twitter, the first reverse sunspot we saw was actually 2018. It is now more than time for the officials to call the next sunspot cycle. This sunspot has outlasted the other active regions on the sun the last week, but has now met with decay this morning, with only the larger lead umbra remaining. Solar wind here, purple plasma speed clearly on an uptrend, but again scaling on the left shows it as a modest intensification only, and up top in orange, stream density is dropping out. From quiet to normal, leaves us still sitting in green geomagnetically. Coming back for another look at the bushfires from the Himawari satellite, it is incredible to watch the evolution of these blazes from space. Offers a sobering perspective to realize how many people and animals have been affected down on the ground. On the other side of the scale, this is Greece. About a meter of snow here, which is fun because when they went to bed the previous night, there was not a flake on the ground. We're going to check out NGC 4455 here from Hubble as it is a nice aesthetic transition into the science articles. This galaxy 45 million light years away has a lot of stars, a lot of gas, a lot of dust, but we don't see much activity in the core, nor do we see an active galactic nucleus. Let's go on to something that has to make us rethink which planets out there have water vapor atmospheres. Turns out one of the best ways we thought we could see into the cosmos doesn't work so well at the fine detail level. Where else have we heard that before? Anyway, moving on, up next a piece on how scary things are going to get when we have less snow. They say this decline in snowfall is going to cause a runaway effect, but of course, we once again must broaden the data set. They were indeed only looking at spring snow cover, and if that's all you see, their analysis is correct. Paper published, grant renewed, pats on the back. The problem is that snowfall is increasing in wintertime and vastly increasing in the fall. I wonder if their exacerbation stance works the other way around. Maybe we should ask them. Up next is Dwarf Nova, three new ones. They say this is a type of nova that happens in the accretion disk around a star rather than at the star itself. And that's despite all the discussion about this type of material around a star causing it to go nova itself. In truth, all we actually get are points of light in the sky, which we interpret in terms of their rise, their fall, frequency, range, and distance, making our best guesses. But at the end of the day, when we get a paper like this, we really have no idea if these are accretion disk dwarf nova or something closer to a micro nova or type 1 pulsar burst. There are dozens of nova names, many new ones seen every day. So folks, just two days ago, we showed you this blast from the past. It would indeed have been terrible if this 1998 CME hit Earth. But now, folks, let's go ahead and check out one of the scary ones from the most recent sunspot cycle. This was 2011, June 7th, and it is easily one of the top two gorgeous coronal mass ejections ever captured. It did reach X-class in the flare blast, but here they wanted to investigate all the wavelength emissions. They found an interesting 30-second oscillation in the flare light, and they are not entirely sure what to make of it. By the way, some of my favorite shots of the event were the bits of plasma that didn't escape, falling back, and crashing down. And speaking of solar storms, not all of them miss. In fact, we take dozens of impacts every sunspot cycle, and one in August 2018 appeared to have been small space weather directly aimed at our planet, and for a while tricked many into thinking it wasn't so small. But it was indeed a minor CME impact, followed by a moderate coronal hole stream, around 500 kilometers per second. This is weak space weather. Despite Earth taking X-class flares and major CMEs in the years before, and coronal holes that topped out at 800 kilometers per second, these punier ones in 2018 produced one of the stronger geomagnetic storms of the last decade, and ties back to that critical catastrophism point I tried to make last month. The only way to track the ongoing magnetic reversal of the planet in between the official five-year updates is to see if weaker and weaker space weather have stronger and stronger Earth effects. It happened in 2015, and now we know it happened in 2018, too. We greatly appreciate your support. As I mentioned, our weekly website podcast is coming up here. I'm with my kids most of the day after that, but still, either tonight or tomorrow, Part 2 of the new series is coming out, so please watch Part 1 if you haven't seen it yet. 
find the link right down below this video. We've got wind map forecasts and shots of our star to close. And of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow, right here. But right now, it's 4.20 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone.